Hey guys, and thank you for joining us for this episode. Um, this is going to be a really neat episode. Ryan and I, for quite some time, have wanted to really discuss news, and and not just not just discuss newsworthy stuff between us, because we're just a couple of idiots who chat around a bar. But we want to discuss news with a real reporter. And today we kind of got our dream wish list uh, thing going here. Uh, so we have Nick Day. He's, uh, he, he's quite a tenured uh, reporter uh, at Coindesk News, um, which is, uh, you know, hands down one of the top sites in the, in the space when it comes to crypto. Um, and I'm joined here alongside uh, my co-host, uh, Ryan Gorman, as well. Um, Nick, thank you so much for taking the time. I see uh, we, we got you while you're sitting in your car in a parking lot somewhere. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, man. I, you know, one of the things that fascinated, fascinated me about um, really like having you on and kind of picking your brain and hearing some stories was uh, you, you really covered in depth one of the largest uh, crypto scandal stories from an exchange, um, you know, in let's call it the last since, since Bitcoin was born, and that's Quadriga. And I, I think this story, I mean, to this day, it's still, you see little bits come out here and there in news feeds, but it still keeps everybody wondering. I mean, there's, there's a guy who, who had a switched name and in a previous life, there's a ex-wife, there's, there's all these people involved, there's a sailboat, the trip to India. Um, it, it really makes for a great episode of a crime show on TV. Um, it, it, you know, how did how did you start? It's been almost two years since you started covering this, right? Or, or when you began? So um, I've been covering Quadriga as an entity since, I want to say, mid-2018 or so. Um, I had a couple articles out before everything kicked off last year. Um, cause, you know, just looking at the exchange, it was, they were in a court fight with the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce over funds that Quadriga had stored through a third-party payment processor uh, at the bank. And, you know, the bank was just trying to, they said that they weren't comfortable with being able to source where those funds had originated. So that was a whole thing. And eventually I believe a court did order the bank to release the funds back to Quadriga through the payment processors or through another payment processor rather. Um, but yeah, that whole, that started in 2018. Well, before. Or that caught your eye before any of the high profile scandals started then that's right. yeah so okay yeah. one of the things i do want to note to uh to, to everybody listening and watching is that links to to nick's stories that he's written across over the years on quadriga are going to be in the description um there we'll, we'll put them in chronological order and uh they're definitely worth the read um so, uh, you know, when it, when it comes to this and, and, and death and, and, and stealing and, and whatnot, um, what was the first thing that you heard when it turned into an investigative, let's call it scam piece? Um, so, this actually, I wrote about this uh, in December, but we actually got a email, an anonymous email saying that the founder, Gerald Cotton, had died in early January. So a couple of weeks before this was announced on Quadriga's website or, you know, shared with anyone really. Um, we got an email that said, you know, uh, the sender of the email said they were at Cotton's funeral and that he died under mysterious circumstances and that Quadriga was broke. And we started looking into it once it happened. We reached out to some contacts there. We were trying to, you know, confirm anything. We went so far as to try and get a debt certificate out of the relevant um, agency. And we had a little bit of difficulty really, you know, confirming the details. We didn't have, you know, things like the date he was reported to have died, anything like that. So basically straight from the beginning of 2019, we were looking into this as, you know, just kind of like, whoa, holy cow, like what? Like kind of that kind of story. And then you know, they announced it a couple of weeks later and that was when we went from, you know, oh, well, this is a weird rumor, but like maybe it's got something to, oh, geez. 
And what, what kind of, yeah, I mean, really, where does it go from anonymous email rumor, and, and I guess this is the basis for any, any story where you're getting a hot tip from, to saying, wow, this has legs? I mean, is it when something doesn't quite, you know, jibe up uh, with what, what someone is saying when you ask uh, another source? Or, like, when does it make the hairs on your neck stand up and you're like, wow, this is worth, you know, spending some time on? Um, yeah, so it's, it varies. For that one, you know, the first thing we did was we reached out to some people in the Canadian crypto space who we thought might be able to speak to it. And the fact that we weren't really able to get anything was kind of in and of itself almost a little suspicious because usually, you know, you could at least get someone saying like, well, no, that's a crazy rumor. Why would you say that? Right. But we couldn't even get that. So that was like, that would have been the hair standing on our next moment right there. Um, normally, like for another story, you know, if we could get corroboration, that would be great. That's usually when we'd be willing to start moving forward with, you know, something we plan to publish. But in the early stages, really just talking to as many people as possible and, you know, seeing, you know, how many of their stories line up, you know, as an example, this isn't a Quadriga story, but I wrote something last year about the SEC and FINRA and, um, that started out with like a single person telling me a single rumor and I talked to I think almost a dozen people who all said basically the same thing and when I went for official confirmation I didn't you know I wasn't told outright that the, you know my story was wrong so that was the point where I talked to my editors and we were like okay well this looks like something we can publish so basically just seeing how many corroborations you can get and just verifying that they're all kind of independent of each other um, you know, if I were to ask you, to, you know, what are you host a podcast? And then I would ask Ryan, what are you host podcast? You guys are kind of, you both listen to podcasts. So you basically, like your stories are likely to be the same. Um, but if I were to ask like some random third party, you know, an audience member, do you guys host a podcast? And they were also to say it, that would be more comfortable than just, you know, you two telling me yourself. That's a terrible example, but. Oh no, it's fine. Um, I think it goes to uh, the heart of what makes this thing so weird and so mysterious. There was no real uh, cause of death listed on Gerald Cotton's uh, death certificate, or was there even a death certificate to begin with? And then the fact that he had a closed casket funeral, right? So no one really knows where the body is. Was that like Crohn's disease or something? Yeah, the, the official story is like it was complications due to Crohn's disease. And didn't they misspell his name or something I heard? <laughs> yeah, so that was actually uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Quintus reporter in India, was able to track down the hospital where he purportedly died and get a birth certificate. And I, yeah, they misspelled his name, um, his last name twice, I think. All right, let's 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 do this, Ryan. Before we move ahead, Nick, if you, you literally just in, 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 in less than a minute here, give us a, a Quadriga timeline, right? So we have Quadriga, it's formed, it's in Canada, it's a crypto exchange. Give us just a few highlights from there, uh, you know, up to the founder is, you know, reportedly dead. Yeah, so um, it, it started, uh, I don't remember the exact year it started, but I remember they were one of the slightly earlier ones, you know, 2014, 2015, I think. Uh, so even earlier than that. I know that in the past, Coindesk even reported that they were one of the largest exchanges, if not the largest exchanges in Canada. Uh, Gerald Cotton told a previous colleague that the exchange had multi-factor, um, no, sorry, multi-signature wallets and, you know, those kinds of security procedures. To So basically, the implication was that it had a large team of folks, or at least multiple, you know, employees who were working on it and who were able to help secure the wallet. Um, fast forward, you know, this is based on um, reporting it from investigations by Ernst & Young, which has been kind of unwinding the company, but it appears that, you know, 2017, 2018, 2019, or not 2019, but 2017, 2018, possibly, around then, uh, Gerald Cotton started margin trading um, using customer funds on other exchanges. So you saw, or Ernst & Young reported that customer funds were basically lost on, you know, very risky trades of like OMG and Dogecoin and just other small cap cryptocurrencies that possibly shouldn't be margin trading on. But there's a tune, but, but in the amounts of like nine figures, right? I mean, a hundred million. Yeah, it was a lot of, yeah. yeah, a lot of customer funds were lost this way. 
Um, the Ontario Securities Commission even said that Quadriga Rica operated like a Ponzi scheme later on. Um, basically using qu uh, customer funds to fill other customer uh, requests because those customers funds weren't there. Fast forward to, you know, 2018 and all of a sudden what, you know, fiat funds Quadriga had were also now being held up in legal battles because like I said, the CIBC was questioning the source of these funds. So my guess is, you know, Quadriga at this point was in like a very weird spot financially from the sounds of it, just from based on the Ernst & Young reports and the OSC stuff and what we heard about the CIBC fight, um, you know, mid to late 2018, customers that were having difficulty withdrawing their funds. They were complaining on Reddit in particular. And you could see, you know, Quadriga's Reddit representative kind of saying like, oh, you know, this is temporary. We're getting this resolved. This is, you know, largely because of this legal fight. And customers were kind of, you know, so some of them were buying it, some of them were kind of, you know, very skeptical about it naturally. And, um, you know, we saw that, you know, as we moved into 2019, you know, that went from Quadriga has funds and just can't access them to, uh, you know, Quadriga is, has no funds, funds that was reported. And at the time, you know, the word was that, you know, Cotton was the only one who had access to the wallets. So no, you know, it clearly wasn't a multi-signature wallet or it was somehow a multi-signature wallet where all the signatures were controlled by Cotton. Fast forward even further and EY was like, eh, no, they actually, there's no funds here. You know, these wallets are empty. So it's basically just kind of, you can you can see that it, whatever funds Quadriga started with, it was kind of just apparently vanished. They were uh, they were kept in a wallet. The wallet really right it was uh, it was just his laptop, and he was the only one who had access to it. If I'm not mistaken, correct? That was what was said. Yes, um, I think I know EY tried to find someone who could break into the laptop. I don't know for sure. I think that what they later reported was that the laptop didn't actually have, you know, the wallet didn't have the funds to begin with at the time that they, you know, at the time of Cotton's death, it's, it, you know, it had some records, they were not really organized, but Ernst & Young's contention is just straight up, they could not find the $200 million uh, worth of crypto that Quadriga was supposed to have had. Huh. I, th this is fascinating stuff. I mean, uh, you know, Ryan, it, it, it guy keeps all the exchanges funds, hundreds of millions of dollars on a single laptop. <laughs> um, I, he, here's, here's something for, you know, speculation. So, I, you know, I read the story of him going to buy this sailboat. Okay. So in the midst of all this swiping money and stuff, he, he goes to buy this, this decent sized sailing yacht. <laughs> Um, it, it, did you ever find any information out on whether he was planning to use that as an exit vehicle and kind of sail away to the Caribbean or, or anything like that? Honestly, this is the first I'm hearing of that particular rumor. But, uh, <laughs> I'm officially <laughs> starting it. <laughs> yeah, he, he had a sailboat. He had like a private jet or a private plane, I think. Um, he owned an island. It's, there was a, you know, they, he, the funds were... Or, the funds. Cotton definitely clear, uh, appears to have spent quite a bit of money on uh, let's call them luxury items, um, you know, fancy cars and multiple properties. And like I said, an island. I mean, you know, I don't own an island, but I imagine it can't be cheap. Um, I mean, I can't buy an island, can you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. Um, when did this, I mean, where does it stand now uh, as far as, is there going to be any recuperation of any funds at all for, for clients of the exchange? Is, is anybody getting, um, you know, payback for, for, for what happened? Or is this just a, a complete mess where everybody is, is just left walking away unhappy? I mean, it really, it's really looking like customers are going to be getting pennies on the dollar, if anything. But Ernst Young has so far recovered, I think, maybe like $30 million uh, U.S. And most of those are from the fiat holdings that were being kept by payment processors. So they haven't been able to recover much, if anything, uh, 
in terms of actual cryptos that were being held and that's where the bulk of the customers funds were kept so they recovered um you know i don't even know if it is a full 30 million i haven't looked at the numbers in a while but they've recovered just you know a couple million fiat uh dollars in u.s and canadian bills and uh, i say bills it's bank accounts and stuff but um it's uh you know they it's customers were owed well over that um you know, you had a couple, you know, individuals who had hundreds of thousands of dollars on the exchange. You had a lot of customers who had smaller amounts, but still, you know, well into the four figures, um, which is, it's, not, it's a not insignificant chunk of money. So it, it really isn't looking promising. The other complication, of course, is that uh, while Ernst & Young and like the four or five law firms that are involved, three or four law firms that are involved uh, have started getting, you know, their own payments, they're still going to be owed funds at the end of this, uh, fees for their services. So there's a good chance that whatever is recovered, there will be some chunk taken out of that as well before this is all wrapped up. Of course, they, they, they have to get their cut. Um, but uh, one thing I've always been curious about, you were one of the few reporters who uh, traveled all the way up to, what was it, Nova Scotia, to be in the courtroom itself. What was the mood like during that first court appearance and then subsequent ones after when you were up, in the, up there covering that case? Yeah, so I, I went up to the first court case, uh, for, uh, first hearing, uh, right after they filed for creditor protection. It was weird, right? Because you had the the audience, so to speak, in that courtroom. You had, you know, a lot of reporters who were trying to figure out what was going on. You had uh, you customers who were trying to, again, figure out what was going on. You had various lawyers. Um, Jill Cotton's widow, who filed the creditor protection form or claim, uh, she was not in attendance, presumably because, you know, she would have been mobbed if she was there, but you saw basically her lawyers, you saw, um, you know, lawyers for Ernst & Young, you saw, I think Ernst & Young themselves had representatives up there, um, and you had a couple other lawyers who were, you know, just there to try and figure out if they wanted, you know, if they were going to be able to represent the customers or the, you know, now former customers. It was a very, you know, weird very odd mood. Uh, um, you know, in I spoke to some of the journalists who were there. Uh, a couple of them even interviewed me because, you know, this was like a first for them in terms of they were covering a crypto case now. And I think I was the only crypto, I was one of two crypto reporters who were up there. Um, it was a, a freelancer. Um, and it was just kind of, you know, there was like, people were just not like, wait, how did this happen? What happened? Like, are you sure that this is what, like, it was just such a, you know, odd mood. And then, you know, I tuned into a lot, a lot of the subsequent hearings were live streamed. I tuned into a lot of those and you could see that it was just kind of, you know, people were basically trying to figure out what was going on as it happened. I mean, there's some precedent for companies folding, but, you know, the circumstances of Quadrigo were unique, even without the complication of, you know, the founder, is reportedly dead and had only you know all the access to the funds. Uh, it's a crypto company, so it was just a lot happening in this kind of you know that's covering up this uh, not covering up but that's complicating this you know standard like company folding case. There were odd parallels too. I forget the name of the uh, Canadian mining company. We've discussed this before about how the yeah. family disappeared with like hundreds of millions of dollars. And it was reported that he uh, fell out of a helicopter and jungle animals ate his face and killed him. Like similar bizarre death, tons of money going missing. And um, did you did you hear anything about that among some of the reporters you spoke to or anyone that you spoke to up there? Or was it just too far in the past? Because it was in, I think, the 80s or early 90s that, that happened. Yeah, at the time, I don't think it came up. Um, part of it just because Quadrigo was at the time like just such a, so new, no one had really thought to start looking back at possible precedents. I did. I do remember folks bringing up that uh, same incident. I forget the company as well. But I do remember folks bringing that up a couple months in once, um, you know, once the initial shock had worn off and people were, you know, beyond the point of thinking like, wait, this company is missing what? Uh, they were starting to think, okay, well, has, you know, people have faked their debts, right? And then trying to figure out whether or not that had actually happened. And then that case did come up. Uh, people were like, oh, yeah, so, you know, this guy reportedly, like, fell out of a helicopter. I think it was, like, it was, like, in a helicopter in the Amazon or something. Um, so it was, like, Taurus. I got, like, no audio out of you there. 
Did anybody see him fall out of the helicopter? I mean, I, these stories are, I love them. Yeah, it's, it's just that, uh, like, there are parallels there, for sure. Like, you know, yeah. the tourist in a, you know, different country and just happens to die under odd circumstances. Now, has anybody been charged or gone to jail in, in the Quadriga uh, scandal? Not yet. Not it's yet. something better that will happen, but uh, yeah, so far there have been no charges brought by any agency. Uh, I mean, I, I find this truly fascinating. Um, and, and one of the things that I, I want to do is uh, we're, we're going to ask you um, just a, a few subsequent questions on what your thoughts are on some other items. But um, before we leave the Quadriga uh, portion of this, Ryan, do you, do you want to ask him? It, it's, yeah, sure. I mean, it's on our minds. I mean, this is the one thing that we, we always ask, uh, we always discuss, do you think he's really dead? I actually do. I genuinely do believe he's dead. Um, I know that that's like a huge point of contention. I know that, you know, the former customers are trying to exhume the body to verify and I know that RCMP has not yet really, I don't think they've made any move to do that, but I genuinely do think he is dead. I can't speculate as to like the cause of death um, or like whatever. I, I, there's a lot that's questionable about the story, but it, you know, I feel like anyone who's planned out like this kind of escape, like you would have to assume that your body would be exhumed and like presumably he's got a plan for that or not. But the fact that, you know, it's, if you die in India and your body's flown back and you have a closed casket funeral, if that was me planning out like an elaborate escape, I would assume that I would get exhumed. I would, you know, be cremated or something, right? Find some other way of not, you know, just covering that particular base. Why hasn't he been exhumed? I mean, that would put a lot of this to bed. It's been so long since he died that I, I don't understand why that hasn't happened yet. Yeah, it's... So the law firm representing the customers has actually made two formal requests. First went straight to the RCMP. Second one went to a Canadian minister who um, I believe oversees the RCMP. I can get you his name. And so far there's been just no word and no movement. Um, you know, people have tried to reach out to the RCMP, have been told to contact the ministry or the minister and his office has said to contact the RCMP. And, you know, that's happened, it's happened to a couple other folks where we just, aren't able to get any kind of, you know, response as to what agent or the, you know, RCMP plans to ever do anything there. Hmm. So bizarre. <laughs> it, it really is that. And if you're going to plan one of these things, just from listening to you, uh, have a friend who's an investigative journalist and ask them, you know, what the best steps are to, to cover your tracks. Uh, <laughs> your, your tracks. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, I, I know that you know you really you really like uh, the regulation side of things um, and and you know covering the beat coming out of Washington and and what's going on there. A um, couple things that uh, caught my eye uh, on Twitter and in the news and and people getting all up in arms. Um, one of them being uh, Coinbase um, and not Coinbase going public. But Coinbase selling surveillance uh, technology, which they acquired under a kind of a, a cloud uh, about a year ago, but them selling surveillance equip, uh, surveillance um, uh, reporting to the FBI, and everybody throwing up their arms and saying, you know, oh, how could they do that? They're traitors. Cancel Coinbase. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? We spoke about it earlier. You have an interesting angle to it, and I tend to agree with it. Yeah, so I've been covering crypto for almost three years now. I started in September 2017. And in that entire time, one of the things people have been saying as, you know, a benefit of crypto is that, you know, you can't hide stuff that easily. Like, you know, you can trace funds. You can, uh, addresses are pseudonymous, but you can track the flow of funds from one address to another address to a third address. And it's kind of honestly like, I find it a little surprising that people are suddenly upset that companies are a investing in this kind of technology and then b you know selling it to a willing customer. 
um, you know, I, I do know that, you know, I can tell you that a lot of these agencies are investing internal resources on developing that kind of capability themselves, right? There are FBI agents who are almost certainly trying to figure out how to track uh, crypto from one wallet to another. There's almost definitely IRS agents who are being able, who are trying to track crypto from one wallet to another. In fact, um, you know, the IRS even put out a request for uh, contractors to help them with that task. Um, I want to say in May, it was, you know, just two months ago. Um, all the federal agencies, I don't know about state agencies, uh, state agencies, but it would not surprise me if they were also investing internal resources. So it really isn't like, cause, like, I'm not surprised. I'm not like, like, you know, Coinbase is a company. They're, they're going to have to build out that capability anyway, I think, because of the, you know, upcoming FATA, or not the upcoming, it's past July, because of the FATA travel rule. Um, so, yeah, they would have to invest this kind of internal capability and they are a company and, you know, um, I think they're the biggest like onboarding uh, portal for, you know, novice users in the U.S. Uh, check me if I'm wrong on that, but my, I believe that, you know, yep. they're, so they're, you know, really trying to serve like this, you know, market, but yeah, I, uh, I can't, look, I'm not going to blame them or like, you know, get outraged that they're a company doing things companies do. It's, you know, it makes sense to me. It's um, you know, not like, I would not be, I'm not surprised. And, um, you know, if it works for them, cool, good for them. Yeah. Very cool. Um, before we go, last story you published, uh, what was it? Was it right before this show? And uh, what was it just, what was it about? I, it's got to be something interesting. Uh, so it was just kind of a, a quick news hit, but today the U.S. Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control listed uh, or put out a press release saying that a Chinese drug organization was using Bitcoin to launder proceeds. And it's the same drug, uh, drug organization that OFAC uh, mentioned in a press release last August saying that, you know, they were using crypto to launder drug proceeds. And it kind of caught my eye for two reasons. One is in August when OFAC made that declaration, they actually listed a bunch of Bitcoin and Litecoin addresses saying, you know, these addresses are tied to drug runners. The, you know, if you're basically, if you're uh, getting sanctioned by OFAC, what it means is that it's basically, you know, prohibiting U.S. entities or U.S. companies from doing business with you or from transacting with you. So OFAC was basically telling, you know, the entire U.S., hey, you know, do not transact with these Bitcoin and Litecoin addresses. And the fact that that came up again today, no, I, I don't think any new addresses were added today, but the fact that there, it still came up kind of suggests that, you know, um, this is a, a company that's or a large you know, alleged drug trafficking organization that has been operating for quite some time that has, you know, a, I would assume some sort of a sophisticated operation. Very cool. And uh, we'll see, uh, we'll see how that goes. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's always a lot of chatter when it comes to that side, when it comes to uh, laundering and, and the OFAC list and um, us trying to crack down, um, you know, the last thing that we heard from, you know, and it comes to self, uh, almost exchanges self-regulating to a certain degree. Um, I, I saw on Twitter the other day, you know, we all know about the Twitter uh, hack. Mm -hmm. And um, I saw on Twitter the other day, uh, one of the Winklevoss twins tweet out, you know, hey, the minute we, we heard about this, the minute we saw it, we blocked all the uh, movement from addresses, you know, where this could potentially be a problem in scamming people. So um, I think what you cover is important. It's, you know, it's not the, it's not the most exciting thing people like, you know, a lot of them are like, hey, screw the government, screw regulation. But there's, there's two sides of crypto. Uh, I think there's a libertarian side, and then there is a certain centralized side to it. Um, and I think they can coexist, uh, you know, relative to, to what they do and what people use them for pretty well. Um, but, you know, hey, thanks for joining us today. This has been truly a pleasure. Um, and, yeah, 100 percent. Even if we did make you sit in your car for the last, uh, you know, 30, 40 minutes, uh, we really appreciate it. And, and all the information uh, to, to Nick will be in description, um, <clears throat> his social media handles. 
you if you if you have something really uh, juicy that you want to you know contact them about you'll, you'll know how and and uh, you can go through those channels um, but Nick it's always a pleasure thank you so much I look forward to the next time and um, you know Ryan and I really enjoy your work thank you so much no this is a lot of fun really appreciate it thank you very right. much yes Nick it's been great very cool guys thank you